Tobias, Principal Architect on Front End Tech Choices 2021. So Tobias is the founder of Spartacus, the JS storefront for SAP Commerce Cloud. He started building for the web in 1997, and he's excited about the web ever since. He'd like to inspire you all with his vision for the front end tech stack in 2021. Right, thank you very much for the introduction. Let me share my screen. Okay. And please let me know if you can see it. Yes. Are you guys able to see the screen? Perfect. All right, thanks you very much for having me. Um, I'm, I'm quite excited that you've been um, asking me to have a session here. Um, I've actually worked with Dino quite a lot and, and with Peter um, because I recently changed jobs, jobs. So I was an SAP colleague uh, for 10 years and I've been in the commerce space for like 15 years. Um, but even before that, I was doing front end, um, like uh, late 90s, I started um, fresh with web development. We were called web designers by then. Um, and ever since, I, I really like front end. Um, although I've been in the back end quite a while, I, I was quite happy to, to go back to it. Um, and I put myself this uh, kind of topic, uh, like talking about tech trends. And while building this deck and going over the content, I realized this is actually a very broad topic. So I like to narrow it down to the kind of um, concerns that I have in my day-to-day -day job. So what I'm doing, um, I'm a principal architect, front-end architect, and I'm responsible for building great um, experiences and, and basically kind of templated experiences that our customers can use. Um, and also building uh, business tools that our customers can use to create those experiences. And two of those topics are, are always uh, kind of about uh, pain in the butt, right? The, the performance, it's, it's always about performance, right? Making sure that these experiences perform well. Um, it's not, not only about great UI, it's also how these experiences are performing on your browser. Um, and, and think about this, like when we are creating commerce storefronts, right? This is like super important to have those being highly performing. And with that also the kind of increasing build time that we've seen over time and making sure that this is getting better and better. And then the second point is also very important to us that uh, the ability to make agnostic components. And we've just been listening to, um, to Dino also uh, kind of making components for all different frameworks. Whenever we are creating commerce components that our customers can use to build their commerce storefront experiences, we like them to reuse components and adopt our technology. And this is difficult, right? Because we have so much opinionated frameworks. Now, how we got there here, um, I think uh, just a, a, a quick recap on why it's all became so super complex, right? So I'll spare you the, the first 15 years, but around 2010, we had like those different browsers. And I think they already got in a certain shape of harmonizing on, on like implementations. There were better specs out there and no longer everyone was doing it differently, but still painful. The first iPhone came around uh, a little before and that has changed a lot. And we all of a sudden had multiple devices that we need to take care of. And interestingly before and this time I was using Flash for like a decade. Um, it was already around in 1997 called Future Splash. And this was an amazing technology because you could, as a designer, you could really create experiences without being blocked by browsers who wouldn't have implemented specs or specs that even didn't exist, right? Um, and with Flash, you could create animations. You could even create multi or like single page application experiences in like early 2000. And I think this has been an important thing because whenever we moved into JavaScript and we all realized Flash doesn't have the right future. And I think we all agree to that. This is where we also had a kind of high demand on, on JavaScript, right? Like we really want JavaScript to do very similar things, and like being a, a uh, getting a web platform where we could build like super rich experience just. So I think the, the, the platform got more mature, but complex at the same time, especially because of the multi device, the multi screen and, um, the challenges we have with that. And at the same time, this happened, right? Like we had a um, the ability to create open source. Uh, GitHub came around, I think somewhere 27 maybe, 
and Node.js came around, um, allowing us to have a, a platform to to build new solutions, new technology, and to to run new technology. And npm came around as an as a package manager as well as a a platform where you could distribute your code. And we all know what happened, right? Like uh, npm exploded, so many new things on the web, like new frameworks, new uh, tools, new technologies, and um, I think somewhere around 2014, 2015, I was in a project with a colleague of mine. He was um, he was a backend guy, but he was pulled into a front end project. And he was um, over a beer saying to me, like, there's a new front end framework every four hours. And it really felt like that, right? Like, as soon as you start digging into something which seems to be great, there was something else popping up. And I felt the last couple of years, it, it, it became more peaceful, right? Like we have the three big frameworks, Angular, React, Vue. Um, but I think we're, we're a little bit back, like a lot of things is, is happening again. I think what, what, what I got out of this is after 2010, maybe a little bit later, that we really entered this era of reactive components and single page applications. And everyone was, um, I think, trying to create JavaScript frameworks that you could use to do everything in the browser, you know, basically interaction, creating the full experiences for your full application. Um, and I think that's that's later on we've seen this is actually an issue right? because basically too much JavaScript leaks into the browser. And the browser becomes this runtime to generate the DOM uh, for your complete application. So not even for one page, but for all the pages of the world that you you, you want to open up. And the way this, this works is like, if you have a, um, a browser requesting for a certain page, it will um, basically um, load JavaScript. Right? So that's the first problem is to lo load a lot of data, uh, sorry, a lot of resources. And then these resources are used to kind of create the, the DOM, the document of your model of the page at runtime. But in order to do so, quite often you need to be fueled by backend APIs. Right? So for example, you're using a CMS in the backend or a block system, or you need to have like product data, like all this data needs to be fetched. And whenever this data arrives, then the JavaScript actually creates real um, elements in the HTML. And, and obviously there's a lot of um, performance loss here, right? Like we're losing out on, first off, we need to load all these resources, then we need to load the, the API um, responses, and then we need to, um, dynamically create that HTML. So a lot of issues there, um, and we've been acknowledging that, right? Like, so we've, we've seen two different approaches here um, uh, over the last few years. The first called server-side rendering. Uh, so basically what we're doing here, we're going a little bit back. And like in the 90s and early 2000s, we were creating static pages. And, and now we're a little bit back to that because we're going to create or generate these static pages in a server. Uh, on demand, basically, in this SSR process. So the browser will request a certain page, and the SSR server at runtime will then say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get you a page. So it will basically generate the page on the fly. It's actually a, quite a, a heavy process, so it's it's always recommended to, to store the result of such a page into a CDN, for example, or some sort of cache or store. And, and obviously, this um, will generate static content, so it can't, it, it needs to be regenerated at any point in time. Yeah, so at, at, at a certain time, your, your product data or your price data, what have you, will be um, out of sync. You need to regenerate this. An alternative process, but very similar actually, is called um, static site generation. And it's doing a similar trick, but it doesn't do it at runtime. It does it uh, at build time. It's, it's almost the same. Um, you end up with pre-rendered pages. So the rendering happens on the server, but this time around at build time. Um, and the browser will load this HTML. So it's static HTML. And the latter, this SSG, I, I just quickly checked it yesterday. So there's this Gemstack um, page and they are listing all these generators. And I was quite amazed about the high number of generators that are listed there, right? There are like 343 generators out there, which is crazy. Like it, there's so much choice and cool as well, um, but, but crazy as well. So this is, is also um, 
the, the problem with this architecture, and especially with the, the, the first one, which is SSR, is that the single page experience is still applicable here. Um, so how, the way how this works is that whenever you are generating a static page, the static page lands in your browser, but with it, it will also land um, the, um, and, and I can have a slide for that. It, it will also um, load the JavaScript um, uh, framework with it. Reason being that whenever the, the static HTML lands in the browser, um, the JavaScript framework wants to, what we call hydrate it. It wants to basically own this HTML because whenever the, the user starts interacting with the page, it wants to be able to have event listeners assigned to all the elements. And so that you are in a single page experience mode. And this is of course great, right? Because single page experiences are great, um, but the performance is really suffering here. And um, with the new uh, core web files from Google, this is actually something that, um, that will hurt our SEO, uh, for example. Also what we do here uh, in order to make sure that whenever the static page is being generated and the hydration doesn't regenerate the actual DOM, uh, the, the full state of the page, like this is the CMS data or this is the first data, will all be put into the HTML as a, as a kind of a JSON blob, which makes the, the size of the HTML even bigger. Um, so it's actually quite clunky. Um, and only recently we, we've seen a, uh, a new technique appearing and this is called partial hydration. So partial hydration basically means that um, it by default um, will not generate any uh, JavaScript. Right? So the, the, the page is fully HTML, but only where you, where you need to, uh, it can sprinkle in some JavaScript. So uh, think about an e-commerce page, let's say I'm landing at the product detail page then most of that page is very static. Uh, but maybe there's a carousel with, with some upsell or cross sell, or maybe there's a cart component which shows me my, the items of my cart. And so that data could actually be um, dynamic, right? Whenever I add to cart, the add to cart um, will be updated, right? My, my cart, my mini cart will be updated. Or whenever I browse into this um, carousel component. Unfortunately, this is not yet uh, fully adopted by the large JavaScript framework uh, like Angular or Pure React, and, and mainly because it's very difficult uh, because those frameworks haven't been designed for this. So it seems like we need to have a new, um, uh, uh, like a, a whole new um, framework to do something like this. Also, it's unlikely that you can do single page application for this. Um, I mean, you could, but then we're a little bit back to square one where we are bringing a lot of JavaScript to dynamically re-render the page and, and recreate the experience. Um, what we see um, is that there are some frameworks popping up. Um, Astro is, I think, a very interesting one. So Astro is uh, named a static site generator and it really aims to uh, render pure HTML. So only static HTML, but you can opt into make some of your commands, um, like do rehydration or hydration of some of those components. Uh, so the example before where I have like the product detail page, you could say the cart uh, component or the carousel, what have you, these need to be hydrated. And they have some interesting uh, techniques or uh, like ways to do this. So you could say whenever the main process in, in your browser is idle, then we start hydrating. Or whenever a component starts to intersect in your browser. That means like whenever components in the bottom of your page starts to pop up or pop into your viewport, into your what you see, then they start hydrating. And so it's kind of a lazy loading technique there, which is really awesome. And this uh, Astro has been founded by Fred Scott, and uh, also has built a, a few interesting other uh, open source projects. And you should definitely check it out if you haven't seen it. And another one, um, is Elder JS um, not so popular? I think as the, as the former one, but this one is actually stable. So keep in mind that Astro is, is not stable; it's not like uh, production ready. Although there are some some sites running with it, and as, um, Elder JS is only working with Svelte. And like if you're building Svelte components, you could actually use Elder JS as a static site generator. And this one also will produce zero kilobytes of client side JavaScript. It's fully static site generator. 
And then another interesting one is Quick. Um, so Quick is taking a very different approach. Um, Quick is from the, um, like the uh, one of the core team members is Misko, uh, the former father of Angular, uh, the one who started Angular in 2009 or 2008. He joined his team and they are building a DOM-centric JavaScript framework. It basically means as the, the application state becomes part of the DOM. And, and this is where the traditional big frameworks are struggling, right? Like if you're generating a static component, then you still need to have some application state that, that the JavaScript framework can understand. And when you click somewhere, there needs to be an event listener registered and needs to understand the state. And uh, Quick is taking a complete different approach. Personally, I'm not, uh, when I look at Quick, I'm not a fan, uh, but I, I haven't seen everything of it. Also, I think this is just the beginning. Right? So there are these new uh, partial hydration frameworks and also the, the, the big well-known frameworks like Angular, React, Vue, they are trying to move into this space and, and, and let's hope they can make it. Um, but it, it feels like this is all pretty new and most likely we will see uh, a whole other bunch of, of uh, frameworks trying to do this. So another topic, um, less of a big deal, but still important is that um, we've seen application bundles growing and growing, um, but also we've seen that the the way these bundles are produced has become super complex um, and time consuming, especially when you have like a bigger application. So the bundlers initially would um, sit in between the JavaScript bundle that is being um, sent to your browser and the JavaScript bundle or modules that were produced by the development team or were loaded uh, from a node module. And bundling all these modules together, right? it's basically observing any change there. And uh, whenever there's a change, it needs to concatenate these, these uh, modules in the right order and produce a, a, a good bundle to the browser uh, during development time, basically. And then the browser will reload this bundle and, and you basically see the change that you have. And when I started um, like JavaScript development with this kind of setup, I think it was around 2011, um, I mean, I saw people struggling in backend applications where they were building Java applications and they had to restart the whole Java application whenever they did a change and rebuild the software and that would easily take a minute or two. And doing this um, at that point in time, I think it was Angular, yes, the film was like super fancy, right? Like you would change something in, in, in your code editor and it would reload all of a sudden. It's no longer like that with, with big uh, fat applications, right? There are so many modules involved and it, it takes quite some time before loading happens. I'm, I might oversaturate, but um, now that we have um, ES modules in all the browsers, we can actually do much better. Um, we can actually directly access those little JavaScript modules in the browser and, and there's no need to do bundling at all. Um, you can just directly load them in the browser and it will happen. And, and ES modules have taken care of this problem. In production, the the the, um, the new generation of build tools will still recommend to do some form of bundling, and, and I wouldn't disagree. Um, although some would, and also there's another interesting um, specification which is now has now landed in, in Chrome. It's called Import Maps, which uh, gives you the ability to tell the browser that whenever there's an import, it can dictate where this import should be loaded from. So you no longer need to worry about relative paths or absolute paths or online paths. You can actually, well, you have to worry about it. We can do this um, decoupled from the actual code base. It's a pretty interesting uh, thing. So we've seen a new generation of build tools uh, rising. Um, started with ES build. Um, and this is just using this approach, right? Direct loading ES modules. Uh, Snowpack, and uh, that's another project um, from the, the author of uh, Astro that I just mentioned, has done something similar. And Vit is actually from Evan Yu from Vue.js, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, founder of Vue.js, he created Vit. And WMR is, I think, only for pre-React. I don't know that one too well. I think Vit is a, a very interesting one. Um, SvelteKit is, is a new framework that's also using Vit. And I, I just read up on a very nice comparison. So no need for me to go into detail there about those four. Uh, so have a look at it. Uh, it it's very, very promising. 
There's also a, oops, a, um, a group called the Modern Web who are really trying to go completely buildless. Yeah, so basically means there's no builder needed at all. You can just use the browser capabilities. So if you're interested in that, you can read up on the modern web uh, dot dev. Um, this is a group of um, uh, people from ING who are fully full blown into web components. Um, and, and they are really emphasizing on trying to use as less as uh, needed tools uh, because we all went into the habit of just using Webpack and, and use this for building our applications where if you think twice in a lot of cases, it, it's not needed. All right, moving on to the last topic. So this is an interesting one uh, in combination with what we've just uh, seen with um, uh, fundamental libraries. So um, frameworks don't really play well together. And to me, this is a big problem uh, because I try to build um, storefront components, reusable and let developers who are at our customer side um, use those components. But if I decide today to use, for example, React, tomorrow someone will complain because he wants to use Vue or he wants to use Svelte, right? Or he wants to use Angular. And who knows what is, is available uh, the day after tomorrow. Um, so we, we seem to have this so-called framework lock-in. Uh, and, and it seems to be the case that we need to build applications in a single framework um, and that there's no way to reuse components cross um, applications like a, a design system easily. And, and like I said, um, third party developers are forced to use a opinionated framework, but also for ourselves, if we, want, if we want to evolve an architecture over time, this is becoming very difficult. And, and I had an example where I had like a, a big customer uh, who wanted to use a product of us, who, which was written in Angular. And they actually had built a full blown component library in React. And so there was no deal, right? Because um, they had invested so much time and money into this component framework and there was no way to reuse this in, in our stuff. So it can really be a deal breaker. Um, so ideally we have an ability to, to not have this lock-in. Also, even if you are agreeing on a single version, a single uh, framework, then you still have this version lock-in quite often. And like if you have like newer components of the same framework, they might conflict with older versions. So it basically means you need to upgrade the full um, component set in, in one go. And if that's all part of a mono repo, it might not be too bad, but as soon as you start pulling in, uh, pulling in multiple uh, component libraries or um, even um, like like little components, it, it will uh, be a blocker. So I think web components is definitely the answer there uh, from a specification point of view and from how these components can be landed and composed in a single uh, framework. And I've, I've looked at web components uh, around three, four years ago, and I was super eager to use it. Um, but by then it appears that it was only available in JavaScript, right? You could only create components, web components by JavaScript. And this was basically um, a showstopper right? because of this static side rendering and this server side rendering, right? because we need to generate static um, HTML. And I have not even spent uh, any words on saying that this is also super important for SEO, right? Like for Google search to index it, you need to expose the components and um, the, the search engine or the social platform shouldn't uh, build this on the fly. So I'm quite stoked that this time around, and I think six months ago or a little bit less, declarative shadow DOM landed in Chrome. So now we're able to actually generate web components in, in pure HTML. And although there's no support for all the browsers, there's quite a nice polyfill, which is not too expensive to uh, to render those components uh, in, other, in other browsers. That being said, it's still not embraced by all the browsers. Yeah? So there's some browsers who are not yet uh, responding to this new proposal or haven't given their direction. So that's still a little bit worrying, um, but it's definitely uh, going in the right direction. And I think because of this, um, to me, it appeared that in 2021, we had a lot of uh, noise again around web components. Like I'm, I'm reading Twitter um, day and night, uh, a lot around front end technology and so much stuff happening around web components. Um, 
there's this new custom element manifest, uh, which is analyzing your web components and comes up with a, a nice meta model, which opens up a lot of um, uh, a lot of new techniques uh, to to understand the the, com the components. So if you're interested in this space, I would definitely look at Lit, uh, which is from the uh, Polymer team. So it's a team from Google. Uh, they are investing a lot in this, and they have a really nice, uh, clean framework to create web components. Also, um, I've, I've been reading up on Fast, uh, Fast from Microsoft, and they have also a very interesting framework. They uh, have a slightly different approach to, to Lit, but I think both are really strong candidates. And the beauty, if you go down the web component uh, route, is that you can change, right? You don't need to all be all on the same page necessarily, uh, as long as you produce web components which can be uh, rendered in, in the browser. They can have, actually live next to each other. There's this uh, nice group called Open Web Components, uh, actually the, from the same people behind uh, this mode on web, uh, also from the IMG team. And they have um, created a documented, uh, nice approaches around web components, also create um, a, a scaffolding uh, tool so you can generate uh, your project. So it's worth looking at. An alternative could be to use um, a, a meta framework um, or a framework that is able to work with all kinds of um, uh, frameworks. And this is another, uh, I would say, new hot thing what's happening in 2021. So again, Astro, taking the third box here, um, is able to compile pages from components from various frameworks. Right? So it supports React, it supports Svelte, Vue, Pre-React, Web Components, Plain HTML, but you can even bring your own. Um, so it has a kind of a plug-in mechanism. It, and like I said before, it works like a static uh, site generator. This looks uh, very promising. Another one is interesting one, uh, which is uh, a sister repository from the team behind Quick, uh, the one where the father of Angular joined. They are um, creating a meta model out of um, kind of a JSX um, component syntax. And as soon as they have this meta model generated, they can actually generate React components or Svelte components or Angular or Vue or SolidJS components. So it's also a very interesting approach. And when I was uh, reading, I couldn't find it, unfortunately, but when I was reading up on the custom element manifest lately, I think there was another a similar idea to use this meta model to produce uh, components on the fly. This is kind of similar idea uh, with this um, mitosis framework, I hope I pronounced it correct. So these are the things I've been spotting um, and I'm already on time as you said, some quick uh, key takeaways. I think key, single page applications are definitely not there for in, everyone. Um, I, I'm personally a little bit um, disappointed about this conclusion, but in order to give get the right speed, we I think we need to give in a little bit on that. I think Astor is very interesting to look at. Uh, reminding it's on uh, an alpha beta state, but it does tick all these boxes, right? It does partial moderation, it's using uh, their own um, ES module loader, and it's using the multi framework approach. And certainly a lot of traction around web components. So for me, it's definitely something to look at. And with that, I'm at my end of my presentation, uh, and I promise to do a, a quick QA. So I hope there's still time for that. So if you have a question um, vocally or, or by written, don't uh, be shy. Uh, I'm not sure if I can see the chat. Let me stop sharing. Yes, we have two minutes remaining. If anyone has questions for Tobias. Well, we do have a question and from the audience. The person we do asked, or we do? Yeah. Yeah, we do, we do. Yeah, would you mind uh, um, reading yeah, it? Yeah, I can me? read it out loud. So the person asked the UI5, WebC, and fundamental design differs, which one should be used as reference? And the fundamental for Angular has also components. It's missing some in comparison to UI5 web. Um, so what exactly are the differences? These are the questions. Yeah, so Dino, I'm sure you want to answer that one. Yeah, <clears throat> maybe I can answer, yes. Can you guys hear me? Um, this is a good question. Um, 
there are differences. Again, uh, some components in, in both libraries are missing. As I said, fundamental library basically brings the components that are uh, needed the most for the stakeholders. It's an open source. So um, we're working with line of businesses and then if they need some component urgently, they also can contribute it as well. We're trying to do it, um, but at the same time, we're open for contribution. We can follow up with this question. I would suggest later in the other town, the person who asked maybe can, can uh, join. Thank mm -hmm. you.